So I want to welcome everybody to the Amherst Community Chat for Thursday, March 11th. Today we have Planning Director Chris Brestrup back again joining us, as well as Building Commissioner Rob Mora to discuss the um, upcoming zoning amendments and answer your questions about that or other topics. So before we have our guests introduce themselves, I will give uh, your town manager, Paul Bauckham, in a few moments to give any general town updates he might have. Thanks, Brianna. Yeah, so I guess Chris's ratings from her last time on were so high that we had to bring her back to keep our ratings up. That's great. Thanks for taking the time, Chris. Um, we were just talking about how these are 30 minute sessions, so they go pretty quickly, which which is good. Um, and so the since we're on zoning and, and development and things like that, we were fortunate to have Secretary Keneally from the Secretary of um, Housing and Economic Development in town for half a day yesterday. We were able to show him the Pomeroy Village um, area that, that we have received a $1.5 million grant for um, and walk him through what the intention of the grant was. And that was exciting. He came into the center of town. He met with the uh, chamber and the bid about all the work that they're doing downtown. Um, and we were able to take him up to North Amherst as well to show him about some things up there. So we were looking at, um, we, we threw a lot at him and it went from South Amherst to Center Amherst, to, to the downtown to North Amherst. It talked about projects that are about to, that are really close to being started to some ideas that are being generated to sort of long-term infrastructure needs. So, you know, who knows what he's gonna remember from this, but at least, you know, we had our, our chance in the sun with him as one of his first times out of the office in Boston. So we were really privileged to have him stop here. Um, we had a number of town councilors who were able to be present along with our state representative as well. So all in all, a really good morning. So I'm gonna just leave it at that, I think. Great. Thank you, Paul. And just to um, give the folks in the room a little um, context, we, we do have the, the project that um, Paul referenced, the Pomeroy Village intersection um, improvements up on our new Engage Amherst site. So if you want to go in there and learn a little bit more and start interacting with some of the content, uh, the web address is engageamherst.org slash Pomeroy. So uh, before I ask our guests to introduce themselves, I just want to remind everybody that we highly encourage questions, whether um, using the Q&A function in Zoom or by raising your hand in Zoom and you can ask your question live. Um, so just a reminder to do that. I will ask uh, both Rob and Chris to just introduce themselves for those who do not know them. Um, tell us your, your title, your role, how long you've been with the town and what you do. I'll ask Rob first because Chris is a frequent flyer. <laughs> Hi, Rob. Hi, uh, Rob Moore. I'm building commissioner for the town of Amherst, uh, responsible for the day-to-day uh, -day operations of the inspection services department. Uh, with respect to zoning specifically, uh, I am responsible for interpretation and applying the uh, town of Amherst zoning bylaw. How long have you been with the town, Rob? Uh, it'll be nine years in April. Wow. Wow. And I can I can attest to Rob's encyclopedic knowledge of codes and zoning bylaws. It's it's really impressive. So we're lucky to have him here today. Um, mm -hmm. Chris, could you um, introduce yourself to the room, please? Sure. I'm Chris Brestrup. I'm the planning director. I've been with the town for um, almost 18 years. Um, uh, my role is to manage the planning department, the staff here, um, both in terms of the applications that we receive for um, the planning board and the zoning board of appeals um, and other boards and committees, but also to manage the projects that we um, get involved with. So, Great. Well, welcome back. We are uh, happy to have you both here. So just for, for those who might not know what we're talking about when we're referencing these zoning amendments and zoning changes, could you give just a brief explanation as to what the the processes and where we're at as a town right now with it. You want me to talk, Rob? Sure. I'll talk first. So um, we've been asked by the town council after uh, the town council studied um, a number of uh, many, many different possible zoning um, issues. And um, the town council came up with a list of what they felt were the priorities for them to uh, work on in the next um, six to 12 months um, as far as zoning goes. And um, many of those priorities had to do with um, finding ways to build more housing in Amherst because 
Amherst has a great record of conserving property in the outlying areas, both uh, farmland and forest, et cetera. But um, it really hasn't built very much housing since the 1970s. So um, recently we have built some housing, but it was, it was a long time coming. So the town council is interested in finding ways to improve our housing stock. Um, and then there are also recognized issues with our, our zoning bylaw. Um, Rob and I have worked with it you know, over the years and have found um, that there are problems with interpretation, lack of clarity, um, just um, you know, things aren't really spelled out in a, in a very understandable way. So um, one of the things that Rob is working on, which he can talk about is um, recodification of the zoning bylaw. So that's really taking the whole zoning bylaw, reformatting it and um, trying to uh, eliminate the lack of clarity and the, and the conflicts. Um, but we're also working on specific zoning amendments where we're looking at different neighborhoods like the general residence district and the limited business district um, to figure out how we can uh, build more housing there but not overwhelm those communities. Um, so Rob, do you wanna say anything? Uh, so about the process itself, um, you know, and it can happen a couple of different ways, but the, what we're working on right now actually began with uh, some specific requests from the council to staff to work on uh, a various set of uh, bylaw amendments. However, the process could start with the planning board uh, bringing forward uh, suggestions uh, and sometimes staff uh, uh, has their own suggestions, which are also incorporated into this process. Uh, but uh, from that point, the, the council would choose to move forward with uh, any particular amendment and uh, that would kick off a series of public hearings on the matter. Uh, we're nowhere near that point in the, the process that we're just starting now. We're more in the beginning of the development stage of the bylaw and proposed bylaw amendments. Uh, but at some point in the future, there could be a bylaw, uh, a public hearing process that would begin. So I would just like to add that um, over the last month, we've held multiple meetings with the planning board and also with the CRC about the zoning amendments that we're working on. So if people are interested, they could go to the town website and find the recordings for those uh, planning board meetings and CRC meetings. So a town, town zoning bylaws is really the sort of blueprint for what we want to see happen or what is, is happening in our town. It's, it's an important document and that's how land use is regulated in a community. And it's a hard thing to change because it, re it requires typically for most items, a two thirds vote of the town of the legislative body, which in our case is the town council. So it's a very high, it's the highest bar we have um, in terms of changing laws. So you need a, a, a the actual legislative body has to vote to change the laws of the zoning bylaws. So it's an important process, but it has impact on anybody who owns a piece of land typically. When was the last time that there were any significant changes or updates to the, the zoning bylaw in Amherst out of curiosity? Well, the zoning bylaw has been um, amended over the years, but I would say the last major overhaul of the zoning bylaw was probably in the 70s um, when Amherst wow. experienced a huge surge of growth as a result of the university uh, growing from a land-grant college to a major university and um, developments started popping up all over and people felt that there was a need to um, kind of control the level of development. So, uh, but certainly over the years there have been um, several or many um, amendments to the zoning bylaw. I, I just going to take a quick chance to remind um, a couple of the new attendees who just got into the room. Um, feel free to ask your questions, Q&A, or raise your hand. Um, it doesn't have to be related to zoning, but we certainly welcome all questions. And I do see um, Hilda in the room. So Hilda, if you could unmute and introduce yourself. I'm Hilda Greenbaum, 298 Montague Road, and I'd have to tell you I'm really despondent this morning at what's happening to this town. I've known this town since 1958 when I came as a freshman to Mount Holyoke, and of course, no, Mount Holyoke social life was rather limited. We spent a lot of time on this side of the notch. It was a really cute little New England town with lots of nice little stores to go to. 
which continued, I guess, until Mountain Farms Mall built. But my biggest issue is not with the growth and the changes downtown as much as with the aesthetics. And it seems to be that every single building that Mr. Williams and Mr. Wilson proposed for this town is uglier than the one before. And I would really be grateful to know what kind of control we have over the aesthetics of the architecture and that we really get places that the small businesses can afford to rent. Now they're talking about the overlay district on the west side of the common, which would displace lots of little therapists who rent little office buildings. Where are they gonna go? We lost all the businesses from the carriage shops, lost all the building businesses from the, the tower pizza. They're all gone. What's gonna be the reason to go downtown? The bars are closed. The restaurants are all Chinese takeout. Um, I'm really unhappy with the designs of the Jones Library. I think the thing looks like a cow barn. Um, what can we do about it? We have an article three that controls aesthetics of duplexes. They have to look like what's next door. How can we make the downtown look like what's next? And I think this new thing that's been proposed in today's paper looks like an orange crate. It does maybe long in Northwest Arkansas, but it ain't in Amherst and I'm very upset about it. And so, I, you know, it, it's in contrast to what's happening with the North Amherst Library, which is absolutely gorgeous and absolutely what belongs on a historic building. So we do have the design review board and the design review board will be taking a close look at the latest building that's been proposed. Um, and they will be advising the planning board about what their recommendations will be as far as the exterior of the building and the site, um, the proposed site work. So um, we have the, as I said, design review board. Then we have on the planning board, I think we have three architects who are on the planning board and they certainly have a strong um, sense of aesthetics. So I think there, there will be a very um, careful scrutiny of, of this new building. And it staff, hasn't happened in the past, okay? Staff has the already track, looked at it carefully. Yes, the, the track record is not good. Well, thank you for your comments, Hilda. We, we appreciate them and I'm sure um, Chris and Rob have, are gonna take those into advisement. So I am going to recognize Councillor Dorothy Pam, who is in the room and has her hand raised. If you could unmute and introduce yourself, Councillor. Hi, this is Dorothy Pam. Um, yes, we have a million questions and I will tell you if you haven't probably already guessed that my district is extraordinarily upset, but I'm only gonna focus on one little question today. And this is the practical one of parking. I know the theoretical position that cars aren't needed, but I don't agree with it. I do think we could go bold and say, if you wanna live in this building, have an electric car because the car makers are actually, they've got the message, the cars are coming. And I think that, you know, people then make a choice, but I cannot see living in the real world as I do, how a new building, which I will not discuss the design, okay, but a new building with all of those units will have 16 parking spaces. And when real life comes back, we, we stopped with a Lincoln Avenue parking problem. It went away with the ep epidemic. But if you build more things downtown and don't require any parking, then of course, all of the residential streets will be absolutely just you know, become parking lots and people won't be able to pull out of their driveways. So I, I think that, you know, ideology is, has a place, but I think we have to be practical and, and understand the role of the car in today's life. And also I think a fantasy that these buildings are not just dorms has got to be dealt with because if they were for people, regular people with families and jobs, they would need cars. I teach at Holyoke Community College. If I took public transportation, it would take me back when we, and we're going back to campus for some of the classes in the fall. It would take me almost two hours to get there as opposed to um, 28 minutes driving. And that's a big piece of time. So I, I just think we need a little realism about cars and who places are for. And I, I also wanna put this other thought in your head. If we build buildings, which are like dorms, What's missing? Well, the residential advisor is missing. Any kind of supervision, oversight, um, 
services for the students that are in those buildings. Um, they're not different from the ones who live in dorms who do need residential advisors. There's also no recreation space for them in their buildings, just beds. So I, I don't think that we're you know, serving the students well by what's going on. So I, I want to just ask people to really think about this and not in terms of ideological terms, but in just practical, realistic terms. Who's gonna live there? What do they need? What is necessary to make life comfortable and happy? And is, are these buildings flexible? Maybe it would be students today. Maybe it would be what the people we keep talking about, the young families or seniors in the future is the building one that they would want to live in too. So I just want you know flexibility to be thought of as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And it, anyone want to address any of Councillor uh, Pam's comments before we we seem to hit a um, a hot topic because we've got a lot of hands in the room and some questions in the Q and A. So. Well, I can say that we recognize the fact that there are issues with our parking section of our zoning bylaw, and we do mean to address those, and we may need some consulting help to do that, but that is certainly um, one of the things that we recognize as needing uh, to be dealt with. Um, we also understand that the bid has been working on the potential for building a parking garage, and um, we don't know if that's actually going to come about, but that's another a possibility for dealing with the issue of parking. But, but the fact is that the zoning by, and this is the first time the town, so Councillor Pam is, is gonna be a decision maker on what the zoning looks like. Um, and so this is the first time the council is really looking at the real zoning changes, but the existing zoning bylaw that has been in effect, um, re, this is what it requires in terms of parking. Is that accurate, Rob, um, for this project? So there's, a, there's a requirement for parking in all the different uh, zoning districts. Uh, and in this particular district, that's, you know, the examples being discussed, there isn't a parking requirement. Uh, so the bylaw says you don't have to provide parking at a minimum uh, number per dwelling unit. However, the site plan review criteria does include traffic and parking. Irrespective of what the bylaw count may or may not provide, the planning board still has the authority to review parking and traffic. So instead of simply accepting a waiver request for a traffic study, the traffic study could be focused on the amount of parking need for the building based on the reality or the current situation. And that could be taken into account by the planning board and applied to the project uh, or influenced it to the, to the design of the project, even though our bylaw says you don't necessarily need to have X number of parking spaces per dwelling unit. So that's, you know, that's the, the, the power of the po our, uh, po uh, planning board during the, the hearing process. So these concerns about parking for this particular project will be played out at the planning board level. Is that what you're saying? They should be because it's specifically part of the uh, design review uh, criteria in the site plan review process. Mm -hmm. And then the bigger question that Councillor Pam raised, which a lot of people are raising about parking requirements, um, that's something that would have to be adopted by the town council at some point to change what we what currently it is is in existence That's yes right. and i have to say that the reason that we have a municipal parking district is because for a long time there was no development downtown um, and um, the municipal parking district was actually established i think in 1969 and it was an effort to encourage businesses to locate downtown that and not require them all to have on-site parking then it was expanded and something like 2008 to include residential. Um, but at that time, there weren't any residential buildings being built downtown. So um, now that we've changed that bylaw, we're seeing a flood of residential buildings. So this is a topic that's worth revisiting. Great, thank you. And I have, um, I'm gonna go to the comment and take these in order. Um, so I'm gonna go to this question that was posted and then I see Ken, Jennifer and Ira's hands um, will take yeah. those in that order. And, and so, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think, I think maybe we try to hear from the folks because we only, we're, we're, we're killing the time already. So, so this, this is a more of a comment and it's probably a quick answer. Um, the design review board doesn't have much legal authority to begin with, but it isn't the site of the proposed 11 East Pleasant outside of their zone. No, it's not. Okay. Great, so I'm gonna um, invite Ken into the room. If you could unmute and introduce yourself, please, Ken. 
Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Ken Rosenthal. I live on Sunset Avenue and I'm going to speak only about parking, though I have some other ideas too. Chris, you're right. The reason that <clears throat> there is no parking requirement is because back in the 60s and early 70s, we were thinking about commercial space in town and nobody was assuming that anybody who came into town was gonna keep a car here overnight. In fact, what we really wanted were people to come in, spend a couple of hours, spend their money, go to the restaurants, go to the shops and go home and have turnover. And that's what we had. But we've been talking about the parking problem with residents ever since Kendrick Place was put on the table. I spoke at a planning board meeting and I said, I support very much the proposed the ideas for Kendrick Place, but I don't support how they're proposing to realize those ideas. We know that parking has been needed for the residents in Kendrick Place and One East Pleasant Street. Rob, you can tell us probably how many of those residents have applied for permits to park in town. And those are the ones who have applied for permits. There are the others who cheat a little bit. The parking on, for that a building by the same developers on Spring Street originally had 11 spaces. After it was approved, they came back and said, oh, sorry, now we'd like to take the 11 spaces out and put residential spaces in. And we know that where those cars on Spring Street are gonna go, they're gonna go into the Amherst College parking lot. Amherst College doesn't know it yet, but they're gonna have those people there when that building is finished. So to say that we're going to look at this is a little bit late and we need to look at it today, tonight, tomorrow, because we've been talking about the need for parking for those residential buildings since they were planned and the town has not responded. I'm sorry to sound so negative, but it's the planning department that's got to propose this so that the council can have something to vote on and please do something about that now. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. All right, um, I'm gonna go through so we can make sure we get everybody's hands. Um, so Jennifer, if you could unmute and introduce yourself, please. Uh, I'm Jennifer Taub at 259 Lincoln Avenue. And I'm just uh, reiterating, I guess you hear this every time, um, you know, representatives from our neighborhood speak, but I can't emphasize enough again with the new buildings uh, that are very problematic for all the reasons that Hilda and Ken stated. Um, that the number, I moved here 10 years ago and I've counted at least 12 businesses that I and my solicited on a regular basis, Bart's Ice Cream, the Lumber Yard, Shea Albert, the Tailor at the Carriage Shops, Amherst Wine and Spirit, the Music Shop at the Carriage Shop, the Yarn Shop, Kay's Antiques. There were two nail salons, one by the, uh, I guess by Cousins Market and another right uh, where Clay's is downtown, across from Town Hall that have closed, the Blue Marble, which I, I went to regularly, the Loose Goose. Um, so that's like a dozen small businesses and I don't know, you know, that certainly people in and around downtown solicited regularly, and that's a real loss to the community. And I firmly believe that even if you live, you know, far from, from town center in Amherst Woods, the more, why would anybody really, aside from the schools now, move to Amherst and pay our high taxes if there's nothing downtown but the student, it's getting to be student dorms and then like a mass mutual taking the entire commercial space at Kendrick Place. And there has to be some way I would hope we can require the buildings, the dorms, the archipelago buildings that are already there and any ones that are gonna come that maybe the commercial space on the first floor be made smaller so these small businesses can be there. But this is what makes a town. And it's, um, again, I don't care where you live in Amherst, this is gonna affect the resale value, frankly, and the quality of life of everybody here. Um, and then I would also add, I, we certainly you know, uh, need, I guess, a parking, well, we should be able to, to when they say you can't uh, um, compel the developers of these buildings to build parking, I mean, that's just a nonsensical uh, zoning provision or bylaw that that should just have been, you know, not allowed from when the first archipelago buildings went up. But that said, I guess we are going to need a parking structure, but I'm concerned about it going in like the CVS parking lot, because again, I mean, no parking structure is attractive. Is that what we want to be the dominant building in our town? I mean, we sort of have the uglyification of a huge part of, you know, certainly the northern part of downtown. I don't think a parking structure is gonna, gonna help that. And then the last question on the RGs, and I know I sound like a broken record, but with footnote M in place, where you can already build six to nine dwellings, 
in a backyard, that's plenty. We don't need to increase that to nine to 14. There is absolutely no reason to tinker with footnote M. The RGs already allow for perfectly enough densification. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, anybody want to respond to any of the comments from Jennifer at this moment? Okay. Um, so I am going to go to Ira. If you could unmute and yes. introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Ira Brick, live on 255 Strong Street. And I just want to say times change. And I was just wondering this morning, is Amherst Center still called the CBD, the Central Business District? And I Googled Amherst CBD and the first hit was Rise Cannabis. So things do change. Um, I just want to say uh, I have been watching a lot of town council and town uh, planning board and all of that. And it's been stated many times by the experts in the town that it's hard and the developers, it's hard to attract stores and restaurants and residential seems to be much more the, the better mousetrap that's going to attract paying customers. And so I can see why they are going for that easier business. But now it seems like UMass is saying that they're going to start building a lot more stores on campus. And so, you know, it kind of reminds me of the man whose feet smell and whose nose runs, he's built upside down. And it seems like that is part of being built upside down. The, the presentation the other day by the planning department included a comment that you can't legislate what commercial use. You can't say this space needs to be a restaurant or a store. But also, Christine, who I respect a lot, said we should build things that will entice new businesses here. How do we entice the developers to build things that will entice new businesses here? And what else do we need? We no longer have an economic development director. I understand the bid is hiring a firm that looks substantial, but that's more about emerging from COVID. I would love to see somebody come up with plans in the town that a, a developer, we know who they are, says, yes, I can make money building that stores and restaurants on the first floor with this setback, like really get even more specific. And I know that the building department has been getting very specific and 3D, it's, it's really starting to evolve into something that is more realistic and less objectionable. Um, that also preserves character, which is part of the master plan that's kind of being not only ignored, but disparaged um, the master plan has 15 separate mentions of why if you don't protect and preserve the character of the neighborhood, it doesn't matter what you build, it's going to be bad. Um, so I just want to say, I think we need to think about how to attract in those residences, the families, retirees, workforce, along with student housing that is affordable for them, that is not, you know, as expensive as these new buildings seem to be. So you've heard, you hear from me regularly. I'm sure you could have written the speech yourself, but I just wanted to say it again. Thank you. Thank I you, not, Ira. I had not heard the, the you know, feet smell and nose runs that I appreciate that one a lot. <laughs> All I right, wanted to say a couple of things. And one is that um, one of the things that has been bothering people about the new buildings that have been built to date is that they tend to have the same size unit. Um, particularly the one on Spring Street has, I think, studios and one bedrooms. So the new building that's being proposed that everybody saw the newspaper this morning, that building actually has a mixture of units, studios, ones, twos, threes, and even some four bedroom apartments. So there is a possibility that um, there's more of a possibility that families might choose to live there. Um, I also wanted to make a mention of um, something that came up back in the 2000s when we were really experiencing a lot of financial difficulties in the town. And there was a decision made to um, make it a little bit more easy for new development to come into town and in order to um, boost the tax revenues that are so um, you know, desperately needed by the town to pay for schools, to pay for teachers, to pay for fire and police, et cetera. So, um, you know, I understand that people may not um, appreciate the aesthetics of some of these buildings, but they do produce a lot of revenue in the hundreds of thousands of dollars per year that helps the town to keep running. And um, since we have Proposition 2.5, it's hard to raise taxes. 
Um, but one of the ways we can uh, raise revenue is by having what we call new growth. So that's kind of a silver lining, if you will. Um, you know, it's something to consider anyway about this new development. Thank you, Chris, for making that point. And um, we said earlier before we started that 30 minutes goes by really quick and we are now at 1231. We're kind of at the end of our, our time here. So I would like to invite our special guests and or Paul to leave the attendees with any uh, final thoughts or statements. And if your question did not get addressed um, or not fully addressed, feel free to email us at info at amherstma.gov and I will make sure it gets to the right person. Chris, Rob, Paul, any any uh, final words? I'll jump in first. I, I think that's a really important conversation. I appreciate the, the people in Amherst really educate themselves about the bylaws and things that are in, on the table. And these informed comments are really important for our, the town staff to support the town decision makers, which are ultimately the council and the planning board in their decisions. So uh, I really appreciate that. All right, Chris or Rob, anything? I would just like to say that people should continue to pay attention to the planning board meetings and the CRC meetings um, and town council meetings to uh, know what's going on and um, have an influence over what kinds of things might be adopted. Great. All right. Thank you. Uh, and Rob. Oh yeah. Thanks. Um, <laughs> and just that, you know, there are very specific discussions in the meetings and often not time to talk about, other items. So always feel free to email us uh, questions or comments regarding the bylaw. We are working on other uh, parts of the bylaw. We don't know if they'll ever uh, come into the public discussion, but um, you know, it's good to know uh, if there are any suggestions along the way. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Rob and Chris, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, I know that the planning staff is working on some sort of uh, web page to kind of house some of these changes or proposed changes. So um, stay tuned for that, where you can hopefully follow along, learn more, and share your pointed feedbacks um, as, as that process goes along. So thank you all for joining us, and we'll yeah. see you next week. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.